briefly on a Sunday morning to gather as your people, uh, to be able to bring worship to you, to your Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for songs that are written that help us to express what's in our hearts. And as we gather around your word now and as we open the scriptures, we pray that you will speak, that the words that I say will actually be guided by your spirit to meet the needs of every person present according to their own particular circumstances. We know you can do that, Holy Spirit, and we pray that you would be blessed as we listen to the scriptures open. So we ask this and we give you thanks in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Have a seat. Good morning. Uh, I'm Les Crawford, in case you don't know who I am. Uh, this guy that was on the drums and then jumped up with the mic and led us in our services, my son-in-law, Carl. That's my claim to fame. I'll stick with it. <laughs> Not a good claim. <laughs> and my daughter, of course, is Beck, and apparently a couple of the boys are quite sick. Uh, for those of you who are young mums and you have a child who's projectile vomiting, you know it's not a good thing and you need to hang out and keep away from everybody else. So uh, we keep praying for them today. Uh, we are in the book of Genesis. We're doing a series on foundations and uh, so far we've covered the first four chapters primarily. Uh, we're going to pick up the story of Genesis in Genesis 4.25. If you have a Bible, you might like to open to that section. We're not going to go through it on a verse-by-verse -verse basis, which is kind of my normal preaching sort of technique, I guess you might say, or approach, uh, because uh, Carl gave me a rather large passage to cover, and mind you, he didn't cover all of his passage last week, so I guess I've got freedom to do whatever I like in that respect. Um, but yeah, from 4.25 through to 6.8 is what we're going to look at. Uh, through, I guess, a bigger picture lens than just a microscopic look. Now, I wonder if uh, you've ever been disappointed by the failure of someone's word. You know, perhaps it was a family member's promise, or perhaps it was a friend's communication, or maybe it was a, a leader's assurance, and you were disappointed. You know, it's probably not an exaggeration for us Aussies that uh, we sort of don't really believe the extensive promises that we have from our politicians. Uh, we've just had an election, uh, there will be a new government, and leading up to the election, they have all of these promises. You know, we'll spend a million dollars here or $1.3 billion somewhere else, and we'll make things better for you. We'll improve health, we'll improve aged care will improve mental health, all, all of the things that we certainly need help in. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but all these promises are made in advance. And of course, it's easy to make promises. It's much harder to deliver on them. Uh, and I guess the next four years, we'll see how well the new government can deliver on all of their promises. But I think for the most part, we're pretty skeptical about these large promises. And you might say, well, you know, why is it? You know, why are we so skeptical, we, we don't really believe them. Well, the answer is, of course, the track record of failed promises sort of reinforces the fact that we shouldn't really take these promises seriously. You can't trust their word. You can't be sure that what they say they will do. And on another level, uh, we also look at our society and we see the whole justice system and we kind of wonder, is it really working? I mean, people are being arrested, they're being brought to court, they're being found guilty and then they're sentenced and many people are quite upset about the leniency of sentencing for serious crimes. And so they lack faith in the justice system to give them justice, that will justice actually be served uh, when someone's actually caught and brought to account before the courts? You know, so often, whether it's the positive sense of 
these are the promises that we're making, or it's the negative sense, or these are the penalties that we're applying, uh, we might be quite skeptical about whether really we're getting what we should get. And the consequence of that is that we don't have confidence in communications, uh, and we sort of feel like we're unsupported in life's most difficult journey, because life is pretty difficult at times. And some of us face much more tri trying circumstances than others, but we've all, as a state, had the typical COVID situation of the last two years, uh, and for some of that, it's involved illness, it's involved loss of employment, it's involved many things. And so as we come to this section in Genesis, it's a really interesting section because it has chapter 5, which is an obituary column, full of lots of names. That's why I didn't get Carl to read chapter 5, because it's a challenge just to get through all the names, never mind anything else. Uh, and you kind of think, well, what is it there for? You know, what is Genesis 4, 25 through to 6, 8 there for? Why did Moses write this up? And as you know from previous messages, and as you would know from your understanding of the Bible, uh, that the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, were written by Moses, and they were for the nation of Israel. They're written as a history, not only of the world, but a history of the nation's existence, where this nation has come from, and why this nation exists. And in uh, chapter 3, we have a very particular promise about God's solution to man's problem, in Genesis 3.15. Uh, so God has said certain things to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2. We learn that they were commanded not to eat of a particular fruit of a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that there would be consequences if they did eat. It says that you will die. And then we've had promises in Genesis 1 that there would be blessing, that you would multiply, you would fill the earth. So we've got promises of blessing and cursing in the book of Genesis from the very beginning. And 4, 5, and 6, and 6 further on, is going to show us that God's word comes to pass. God's word is fulfilled. God's word can be trusted. What God says, he means, and he will deliver on what he says. That's really the message that I want you to take away from this section of the book of Genesis. Blessing and cursing. You know, God's word is actually like a two-edged sword. It's actually described that way in the book of Hebrews. Uh, it cuts two ways. And you know, so often we like to embrace the promises. You know, oh, these positive promises, they're all for me, you know. They're all yay in Christ, of course. But there's also the other side of what God says, and that's the cursings. And when you get through to Deuteronomy, you find that there's a whole chapter on blessings and cursings for the nation of Israel particularly but that word applies to all of us and we're going to see the blessings fulfilled and the cursing fulfilled in this section you know so God's word is fulfilled in the gracious gift of life for the multiplication of humanity and the certain judgment of death for all of humanity so the point of that is trust him and his word for your life now and the future. And we're going to see, I think, that unfolded. So the first section that I want to consider is Genesis 4, 25 to 6, verse 1. It's the largest section, uh, and it's basically going to cover two things. It's going to cover the blessing with the multiplication of humanity, and it's going to cover the curse in the deaths of humanity. In chapter 4, we just finished the story of Cain and the murder of his brother Abel. And then it goes on to talk about the building of Cain's dynasty. And it's a dynasty based on selfishness. And it includes a story of Lamech, one of Cain's descendants, uh, who also kills and boasts about it. You know, I've taken vengeance, and if someone takes vengeance on me, they'll be repaid seven times. It's a very powerful declaration of revenge. Uh, but then it continues Adam's story, and it continues with the birth of Seth, 
who is a son that replaces Abel, who was murdered by his brother Cain. And uh, Seth has a son, and his name is Enosh. And we read that in chapter 4, just near the end, and I'll get some glasses to do this. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth was also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's a very good commentary. Now, because the one thing that Adam and Eve hadn't done was to call on the name of the Lord. And the one thing that Cain didn't do was to call on the name of the Lord. In fact, he rejected God's overtures to him to warn him about sin crouching at his door, ready to take all that he had away from him. And now that this new son has arrived, there's this sense in which, wow, this seems extremely positive. You know, this is movement forward. Things are going to go well and go better. And in a sense, they do. They do. God has blessed Adam and Eve with life. You know, he preserved their lives. He actually covered their nakedness, you know, with those skins of animals. And he did cast them out of the garden, but he gave them a future on the earth, and it was going to be more challenging, but it's still life. Life's better than death, especially when it's life in relationship with God. And so despite the entrance of sin, the blessing is going to continue. Adam's descendants through Seth are then listed for us in chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, a reminder that we are God's image bearers. Male and female, he called them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created, or named them Adam when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So there's a a blessing that God is continuing in Adam and Eve and their family, uh, and this image-bearing continues. The son and then the further descendants are all going to carry this image. Now, that has a good and bad side. It has the side of we carry the fallenness of Adam, but it has the good side that we carry the image of God in somewhat corrupted form but it hasn't been lost the image of God hasn't been completely eradicated that's why we look at one another as human beings regardless of any part of our humanity as image bearers and therefore having dignity having value to be respected and loved that doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or a Christian that doesn't matter whether you are someone who lives well or lives poorly you are an image bearer and therefore your life is valuable it's beautiful so here we have the doctrine of original sin actually in the book of genesis this image is carried on from the sinner adam to the son and to the grandson and the great grandson and the great great grandson and to the granddaughter and the so on it goes and uh, if we had time which we don't and i thought carl was going to do this but he didn't we would look at romans 5 verses 12 to 21 in one of the previous messages and look at the fact that it's by one man sin entered the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men because all have sinned and that men is generic girls you are included in that generic sense of humanity and so we read down this list and i'm not going to read the whole list but you've noticed right away that Adam's living somewhat longer than we do, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to have lived as long as Adam lived. The reason why is that Adam will see the consequences of his rebellion for over 900 years. That's a lot of years to look at what your sin produces. And the same is going to be true of the descendants. They're all going to live very long lives. And this is before the flood. This is when a world was quite different to the world in which we live today. But, you know, everyone in this list lives 
hundreds of years. You know, God has blessed them. Long life. I mean, most people today are wanting long life, right? You know, we're all trying to stretch out from the 70 to the 80 to the 90 to the 100. Now, of course, we want to live those final years in good health, mentally strong and aware, able to do the things we would like to do. By the way, you won't be able to. I'm 67, and I know that my body is not as vigorous as it was at 27. I'm getting ready for eternity. I'm getting ready to pass from this life to my next life, which will be far better. But you can imagine how remarkable it must have been to live for so long. By the way, this is the establishment of the human race. And if you're going to populate and fill the earth, you don't want to be living for just 30 years. You're going to struggle to replace your population if you live for a very short period of time. We have major issues in the world today about population being replenished. China has major issues about population replenishment because you have to have a certain number of children to make up for the ones that are dying. Not so in this period. And it's really interesting that in each case of this long life, they have significant multiplication because it's not just that they have a son. You know, Adam has Seth. Then he also has what? Other sons and daughters. And that's true of all of them. Now, you don't get the whole list. Can you imagine how long a chapter it would be if you tried to list every human being that was born in this 1,000-year period? There'd be an awful lot of people. But this is God's blessing. You know, the shortest lifespan is actually 365 years. It's Enoch. And the only reason he's got a short life is because he had an unusual end. It says in the text, when we read down, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters, so he was like everybody else. That's all the days of Enoch were 365 years. This is verse 21. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch did not die. He was not called, and he died. That's the refrain for everybody else. He actually went straight into God's presence. He was walking with God. And God said, come home with me tonight. You don't have to go back to your house. It's a really unusual event. And that's the only reason he's got a short life. And it's not that short, is it? I mean, 365 years, we do pretty pretty good beginnings. I mean, any cricketer would be thrilled to bits to get 365. We reckon if they get 100, they've done well. Now, Noah isn't included in terms of his lifespan in this chapter. We just read about Noah's birth down in 30 and 31 and 32 but he does say something interesting about it it says after Noah was 500 years old (laughs) Noah fathered Shem, Ham and Japheth and he had no other children before that can you imagine having kids at 500 (laughs) I mean that's pretty pretty unreal now I'm not sure why it took so long for him to have kids maybe he couldn't find a wife until he got to 498 I'm not sure what the answer to that is Uh, But that's the reality, because in chapter 6, we learn more about that family. And we also learn how long he lived, uh, because it does tell us in Genesis 9.29 that he lived for 950 years. And he's one of the last very long-living human beings that we have a record of in Scripture. And it's interesting that there's a a second Lamech in this list. We had a Lamech in chapter 4, who was a bit of a disaster, He's a two wives man, and he's also someone who kills for vengeance. But the Lamech in here is the one who has Noah. And Noah is, of course, going to be the chosen one to deliver humanity through the flood. So a really different kind of outcome. One's revenge, and the other one is salvation, deliverance. So despite the entrance of sin through Adam's disobedience, God has continued to fulfill his word. He is blessing humanity, but it's only half of the story. That's the positive half of the story, that humanity is multiplying, humanity has life, but there's a problem that still remains. Because as God had said that those who rebel against God, Adam and Eve being the first parents and then their descendants, that they would die And so we have this refrain all the way through chapter 5, and he died, and he died, 
and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he... That happened even though they lived 900 plus years. Can you imagine, you might have been thinking, hmm, I'm 100, hasn't happened yet. I'm 200, hasn't happened yet. I'm 300, hasn't happened yet. I'm 400. Oh, he not went at three. Oh, but he didn't die. It hadn't happened yet. 500, hasn't happened yet. 600, hasn't happened yet. 700, it hasn't happened yet. 800. Ah, God won't deliver. God won't fulfill what he said. 900. Then it happens. Death. Now, of course, they had died spiritually on the moment they had rebelled against God. They were separated from God. They needed to be restored relationally. <coughs> Excuse me. But the physical death is a re an affirmation, a reinforcement of the spiritual death. <coughs> Excuse me. So, God is fulfilling his word. This is curse fulfilled. I mean, we had seen it. I mean, Cain had murdered Abel. Lamech had sl slayed a man. But everyone, everyone will die. And it's what Hebrews tells us. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto man, unto humanity, unto each individual human being, once to die, and then judgment. Our life is much shorter this side of the flood, this side of the antediluvian world. But sometimes we get to about 100. Uh, we have a, a worker in Las Vegas who works with the Jewish community there, and she had a, a birthday with one of the Jewish Holocaust survivors who turned 105. I can't get over how many Holocaust survivors live a long life. I mean, they get through the Holocaust and they still keep going. I mean, they're tough. <laughs> But 105 is, is quite a significant lifespan in ours. But the reality is, death will come. It's, it's two things that are inevitable in life, death and taxes. You know that. Death comes to us all. And so this is another foundational truth. You know, we've talked about the doctrine of original sin as a foundational truth because of transfer from one to another in the likeness of a parent... But here's another foundational truth. Death comes to all. And what happens after death? God's word is true. It's being fulfilled as it was stated. And completely, comprehensively, there are no exceptions. Enoch is an exception. He's not the standard. He's the exception. And we have another exception in the Old Testament. We have Elijah being taken to heaven. Another person who didn't die. Uh, there'll be another exception when Christ comes and takes us to heaven. If he comes in your lifetime, you will not die physically. Uh, but those are not the norm right now. Those are the exceptions. God's curse on disobedience is death, and history confirms it. And he died, and he died, and he died. What God has said came true and it continues to come true but not only do we have this blessing of God in the fulfillment of his word and this cursing as it were of God in the fulfillment of his word we also have another insight into the character of who God is in verses 1 to 7 in chapter 6 when man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man or strive with man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. 
So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. You know, you would have expected, at least I would have expected, that having experienced God's word fulfilled, both in the reality of blessing, then in the reality of cursing, that humanity would have wanted to maintain a right relationship with God. You would think they would want to make sure that they are not estranged from God, that they are actually following God's ways as they've been revealed. And there's not a lot revealed about what that involves. It primarily involves some sacrificial connection to God through offering and then obedience to God according to the command, which was basically to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and take dominion over the earth. That didn't get rescinded. So you would expect with all of that and seeing it for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, that that would actually produce a different kind of orientation than Adam and Eve had in the garden when they rebelled against God. Or that Cain had when he murdered his brother or that Lamech had had. But it doesn't work that way. You know, knowing God's blessing and cursing for hundreds of years ought to guarantee spiritual vitality. You know, they started calling on the name of the God. Uh, name of God, remember, was Seth's birth. Humanity began to call on the name of God. That's a positive thing, a good thing. But they obviously didn't keep doing it. Because now we read that things are very, very bad. Genesis 6 records the rapid corruption of humanity. Now, I'm not going to try to interpret Genesis 6 and the sons of God and the daughters of men for you. That's a full message on its own, and you probably couldn't tolerate another hour, so we'll leave that for another time. But don't miss the point of what's happened. What has happened is that the human race has been corrupted, and the fruit of that corruption is not nice. It is wickedness, it is violence, it is no God to reign over me, I want to live my own way. That is the story here. Sin has almost entirely and universally corrupted the entire human race in a very short period of time. Now, God actually grieves about this. Now, some people kind of think of God as a, quite a dispassionate, disconnected, disinterested kind of superior power. Other people tend to think of God as, well, you know, he just enjoys beating up on people. You know, he gets a kick out of kicking. The scriptures couldn't be further from that reality. Because when God looks at this, when he sees the wickedness and he sees the intention of their hearts being evil, says the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Now God's intention for humanity was flourishing. Uh, the idea of having a life of fulfillment, of joy, a life of satisfaction, a life that is filled with all of the good things that God's good hand provides has been destroyed by sin. And so this is not God just getting mad and angry and saying, oh, this is it. Slam the door and shut them all out. This is God saying, this is painful. This is hurtful. This is grievous. This makes me sorrowful. But it doesn't mean he won't do something about it. It doesn't mean he won't act. And the flood is the demonstration of that act. He's sorry that he created humanity in the first place because of how they have turned out. God's original design for our human flourishing is under threat by the rebellion of humanity against him. And so God has strong feelings about that. Do not be surprised if God is described in the Bible with intense emotion. Because God is 
an emotional being. And he does respond to our actions, not just with a clinical judgment, but with an emotional judgment. And we do that too. I mean, right now, I've seen quite a bit of images about the war in the Ukraine. And I've seen from our own workers in the Ukraine and in Poland the very personal touch of those situations. And it grieves me. It brings me to tears to see a child lying dead because of an aggressor trying to take control of a country that they have no legal jurisdiction over. That grieves me. Now, if I'm grieved, you can imagine what our Heavenly Father is. He's very grieved. I'm also grieved when I see a law passed in our own state parliament just last year which allows abortion up to birth. I'm grieved. Can you imagine how grieved our Heavenly Father is? You know, Abel's blood cried out from the ground, God said to Cain. There's a lot of blood crying out from the ground. And if it was as universal as it was in these days leading up to the flood, you can imagine the grief that is there in the heart of God. God is sorrowful over human wickedness. Not just angry, because he is. God is angry, not in the uncontrolled temper that we might have, but in the disposition that sin is the greatest offense to a holy God that exists. And so God does have a response. He doesn't delight in judgment. It's not like it's his preferable option. Ah, oh, you know, doesn't matter how well you do, I'm going to judge you. No. He will judge because it's necessary. It's a justice in a universe by a just God. But it's not because he delights in it. Nothing could be further from the truth. He grieves over human sinfulness. He sorrows over human rejections of blessing. I mean, it, we reject the very best and substitute for something far less. It's crazy. Ezekiel is recorded second, uh, twice, actually, in 1823 and 3311, that God has no delight in the death of the wicked. The death of the wicked happens, but God doesn't delight in it. You know, when we give an account to God one day, if we're not right with him, if we're not trusting in Jesus, and we give an account, God will not be delighted in having to send us away from his presence eternally. He will not delight him. It'll be necessary because he is a holy God. It's necessary because he's righteous and just, but it's not something he delights in. He delights in his children following after him in obedience as far as we can in our fallenness. That's what he delights in. And by the way, every parent's the same. You know, we delight in kids who respond to our love, respond to our leadership respond to our care and our direction we, we delight in those kids we struggle with the kids who don't we don't dislike them necessarily we don't have this kind of a, a hatred attitude towards them not if we're good parents but it's a struggle when your children are denying their own flourishing it's a real struggle and we've had it in our life we still have it but god does judge human weakness why does he do it because he needs to cleanse the earth he needs to ensure something that he has promised. Didn't he promise in Genesis 3.15 there would be a future deliverer? That there would be a Messiah? That there would be a Savior? That there would be another human who's actually more than human who would be the answer to this initial sin and all sin? Well, that can't happen if he wipes out the human race. So what happens? Well, we have God's sorrow, the wickedness of humanity, but we have God's grace in verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's an amazing statement. 
You know, if you find favor in the eyes of the Lord, it's not because you are better than other human beings. It's not because you are more righteous. Although in the case of Noah and his family, they had maintained their relationship with God. They were not corrupted. Their generations were not corrupted. But that was grace, much grace, found favor. So the story doesn't end just with judgment for sin because God's already promised Adam and Eve a savior would come and crush their greatest enemy, Satan, the serpent. And God's word is still true. And so God is providing a way for the human race to be renewed, for the earth to be cleansed. And by the way, the invitation was to all. The ark was built, but the invitation was come. I mean, Noah's actually a preacher of righteousness. He actually proclaims the necessity of the ark, not just building it. And there's more to that story next time. So Noah's warned that judgment is coming. He's commissioned to build an ark for his family and the necessary land animals, including birds. And it's this remnant of humanity that God saves that demonstrates his grace and enables the fulfillment of his promise. You see, God's word is settled in heaven. God's word is established on the earth. God's word will never ever be frustrated, thwarted, never ever be overthrown. It stands eternally. And because it does, I can safely trust it. And I can say that for the 47 plus years that I've been a Christian, because I wasn't a Christian from birth, I was a Christian in my late teens, God has never, ever failed his word. His word has never failed. So if you're not a believer here today, your only hope in a world without hope is the person of Jesus Christ, who is the Word made flesh. John tells us that. He's God, but he's also man. He's our Redeemer and Savior. He's the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And so you can trust Jesus because he is the Word of God incarnate. And if you're a believer today, and you are struggling with changes. I mean, we've just got a new government. Some of us might be going, oh, good night. The Labour government's in. What is going to become of us? Well, God's in control of all governments. So we're not in any worse or better condition than we were the day before. We're under a sovereign king, Jesus, who's Lord over the whole earth. And so his promises are still true today. You know, in fact, in Jesus, they're yes and amen. Uh, so are his warnings. So are those reminders that sin has consequences and we need to respond in our own personal circumstances to a gracious God. Because he wants your flourishing. He delights in your blessing. He's not delighting in any other option. That is the character of God. He is an amazing God. So one of these foundations in the book of Genesis is that God's word is fulfilled. And this is seen in how humanity multiplies and grows, but it's also seen in how certain judgment must come to all. So trust him and his word for life now and for your future. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are very thankful that you've given us the record of the book of Genesis because it tells us from the beginning who you are, who we are, and all that that means. We're thankful that you're a God who also reaches out to us in grace as you wrought in this early world judgment. You reached out and brought Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives to safety and made a pathway for humanity to continue. We know the story doesn't continue all that well, but we know that you continue to fulfill your purpose. So you can be trusted. Lord, help us to trust you, whatever our circumstances are today. Help us to rely on your word and its guidance, its instruction, its teaching, so that our lives will be lives that flourish, even when sometimes they involve pain and suffering. That even in the midst of those, we can know peace and joy. We can know your love. And Lord, if there's any here today that haven't really come to the grips with their sin and their need of a saviour, 
pray that your spirit will open their eyes and their ears and their hearts to see that Jesus is the only way. And he's worthy not just of our worship, but of our complete allegiance. And he's needed because without him, we are lost. So continue to bless us as we continue to worship. And we thank you for our day. 